this week on the Back Table Podcast. I remember when I first started doing this, <laughs> you know, initially people would come in, they're like, how many have you done? And I said, you're going to be my first patient. And I wouldn't hold back. <laughs> and I wasn't like trying to like freak them out. Yeah. But I'm like, well, you know, ultimately, yeah. you know, Dr. Hellman, um, my partner that does these, he was really, it was great to work with him initially because I was able to do several cases with him, see how he does it and learn from his any mistakes that he's had or if he's if he's found certain pearls that work really well for it. I, it was really, really important. And and this goes not just obviously for the surgery, but anybody that's wanting to start a new procedure, trying to find somebody else that does it, that you trust, that you can work with is really, really important because you see like, oh, I don't know anything about this. It is OK. I can do this. This is a straightforward thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. Hey, everyone, really exciting news. Our listeners asked and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Back Table and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on the episode pages at backtable.com or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Now on with the episode. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at UT Southwestern here in Dallas, Texas. And today I have a very special guest. I have Dr. Matthew Hensler. He's an otolaryngologist practicing at Christ Hospital Physicians ENT in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he is here to talk to us today about the hypoglossal nerve stimulator for adult OSA. Welcome to the show, Matt. All right. Hi. Thank you. Matt, can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice, your training, your background? Sure, yeah. So I am from Middletown, Ohio. So it's a little bit north here of Cincinnati, about 30 miles, and born and raised there. Went to the Ohio State University <laughs> for undergrad. Hence the, the D. <laughs> for sure, we got to emphasize. <laughs> I think we're still doing that. But And then you did that for four years. Went to Wright State up in Dayton for med school. And after that, came to Cincinnati at UC for general ENT residency. Um, I didn't do a fellowship. I just came straight out of training and joined Christ. And that was 2015, which continues to get further and further away. I can't believe it's that yeah. long ago. So back in 15. And then, yeah, I do general ENT at Christ. Uh, and we kind of work within Cincinnati and northern Kentucky. And and that's about it. And we live in the city. and. We have kids and a dog, and That's there you great. go. <laughs> <laughs> Living the yeah, dream. Yeah. Um, so you went to University of Cincinnati. That means, were you in the same training period, or would you have crossed over with Eric Gantworth? Oh, yeah, Eric. Yeah. Oh, we're great buddies. So Eric was ahead of me in training by a couple of years. So, yeah, we're really good buddies. That's where we met. Yeah. I love Eric. Um, he was a uh, partner with me for a little bit in Dallas, and, of course, is a colleague that um, and friend that I'd love to continue to text and <laughs> talk to. Yeah, no, he's done such a cool job of, you know, taking your training and being able to broaden what you do. And, and it's not just like the straightforward do surgery in clinic. He's really been able to broaden yeah. himself. It's a cool thing. Yeah, it is. All right. Well, let's get into it a little bit. Yeah. Did you do a lot of hypoglossal nerve stimulators in your training? Because I feel like this is something that's a little bit relatively ish new right yeah no it's it is pretty new um actually i did not i didn't do any uh in training so i think the fda approval came around like 2014 for the procedure so when i finished in 15 i hadn't done them at all and i didn't i actually got approached by one of the companies to consider doing it towards the end of 2019 and at that point I'm somebody that I like to see the results of something before I do it. Like if something's new or if it's a new yeah. medication or whatever, I like to see the outcomes. And this was hard to do because there weren't many patients running around with them at that point. And so right. after talking with a lot of former colleagues and, you know, people really encouraged me to look into it, 
And then from the company's perspective, since we work in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, I was doing more of a Northern Kentucky reach and they didn't have anybody around there offering it. So I was able to provide that and I did the training course and it kind of took off from there. Yeah. And you said you have one of your partners that also, it's the two of you guys that kind of work together. Yeah, Dr. Hellman and I, the two of us are the people within our group that offer the procedure. And we're both, like I said, we're both based in Cincinnati. We kind of go to multiple offices, but he and I are the people that, um, that do it with us. That's awesome. Yeah. It's nice to have uh, good partners, um, <laughs> yeah. especially when you're building a program. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you said Northern Kentucky and in the kind of greater Cincy area, how do your patients, uh, how do patients get referred to you? Are patients coming in from, you know, just, you know, they find you, mm -hmm. they come to you, pulmonologists, how's your, how are they referred? Yeah, it, well, that's an area that's still developing. So initially it was kind of hearsay that people would say, I heard about, I heard the ad on the radio or I saw the commercial and that still obviously mm -hmm. happens. It's getting more commercial time. Um, but now we've been able to kind of develop a little bit of a sleep, kind of a, we have like a sleep coordinator within Christ now that works with pulmonology sleep medicine and can help kind of with care coordination so that we can optimize when patients show up. So if they come in and they haven't had a sleep study, we, we're trying to avoid that and maybe get them to see sleep medicine first so they can get their sleep study and then work their way into us. So it's still developing, um, but it's, it's any variety of primary care. Cardiology is actually a developing area too because of the impact of sleep apnea on heart health. And, and, and you're getting more patients who say, hey, my coworker got the implant. That looks pretty cool. I just, I want to check it out, you know? Yeah, I think that's great. So it's a little bit uh, multidisciplinary as well in your practice yeah. with a sleep coordinator, pulmonology, mm -hmm. cards. So just kind of getting into, you know, when patients show up in your clinic, um, like the adult that comes in for snoring, um, what's your initial history and physical look like? What are some of the most common complaints that you can you see in adults with OSA? Snoring, you know, snoring is so common and it's really tough to kind of distill that down and figure it out, well, okay, who needs a sleep study to begin with, right? Because plenty of patients who come in, if they snore and they feel like they've got pauses in breathing when they're sleeping, then they should probably just go ahead and get a sleep study to begin with. But it's a longer discussion, I think, when it's just seemingly regular snoring without concerns for sleep apnea, because there are still a lot of patients with that that, that have underlying yeah. sleep apnea. So aside from talking to them about their snoring or figuring out perhaps what medications they've tried to help snoring to see is this more, is it more nasal? Is it, um, or looking at their habits, is it because they don't sleep enough? Do they sleep heavier or they, have a heavy alcohol intake, so they sleep heavier. Um, those are impactful things. But aside from that, checking out the impact on their life, is it just the sound of the snoring, so it's their spouse that's getting annoyed by it, or is it actually that they don't get good sleep and they don't feel well rested? And I think trying to really guide that discussion more into, do we need to do the sleep study if they haven't already had it? Yeah. Um, and that's where right. I try to go. And then physical exam, you try to see if there's any obvious anatomical issues, which could contribute, you know, snoring tends to be a multi-level process. So it's not often that you just see a, a deviated septum and you say, oh, well, if we fix that, you're going to be better. You know, it's, you try to look at all of the potential areas for obstruction and, and address those as needed. Or again, often the sleep study is, is really a key piece to all of this. Yeah. Would you say that most patients then, uh, before you're doing any sort of sleep uh, surgery for sleep apnea, you have a sleep study on then pretty much? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are okay. a few patients perhaps that, like, let's say they're snoring and they, maybe they also get really bad tonsil stones and they're bothered by, and they have huge tonsils and maybe a really, you know, a pretty open throat. And you kind of think, okay, well, maybe we could address your tonsils now because you, they already know they want those addressed because of their tonsil stones. And perhaps right. you'll get the added benefit of improved snoring. So there's a couple instances like that. But most of the time, if you're going to do surgery with any intent of improving snoring, it's good to find out if they're a primary snorer without sleep apnea right. or if they have some right. underlying sleep apnea. Okay. And then when you do your physical exam, are you scoping all these patients in clinic? You know, do you ask if they've tried, do you try breathe right strips on them? Um, like, do you have them try floating? Like, what, how does that kind of play into some of this? Yeah, I think if somebody hasn't had a sleep study, I definitely entertain all of those thoughts. You know, I say, and I ask them, and 
Many patients have tried a lot of different remedies by the time they show up um, with Breathe Right strips. We'll definitely see if we can improve nasal breathing with like nasal steroids or decongestants for a little time frame to see if that offers improvement. Scopes, it's not that every patient gets a scope, I would say. I think it's more directed based on the exam or perhaps somebody's snoring and everything looks totally normal. And you're like, well, why would this person snore? Or if they report nasal obstruction or other head and neck complaints, which could suggest something that you're not seeing directly, then I think you jump to a scope. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Because, yeah. you know, in pediatric sleep apnea, you know, we we're lucky in the sense that we have guidelines, right, mm-hmm. of who should definitely get a sleep study before. And for us, it's mostly TNA in kids, right. right? That's We're not jumping or thinking about as much multi-level, although many kids have residual OSA after a TNA and many kids, it's other reasons, right? With, from poor tone to lingual tonsils to, you know, large tongue base um, as well. Yeah. And so I, I always feel like, well, at least in the pediatric ENT stuff, I have some guidelines that can help me out. Yeah. With adult, and again, I don't treat adults, um, <laughs> but I feel like I always, you know, I'm always kind of curious, like, okay, how different is it or what are the nuances? And it always seems a lot more complex. Yeah. I mean, you know, back in the day, and I, I say back in the day, like, let's go like 10, 15 years ago, a lot of people were just getting uvula pallidopharyngoplasty and it yeah. was just the, well, take the tonsils and uvula out and we'll trim you up and see if the tightening helps. And it's just been over time that we've seen with the different classifications of pharyngeal anatomy and outcomes that that kind of cookie cutter approach to it isn't working for everybody. So, you know, particularly with the nerve stimulator, they they have some guidelines that they've set to try to guide you down that. But with regards yeah. to working up sleep apnea or snoring, like you were saying, adults, you really just want to get that sleep study to find out. Okay. Are your patients mostly going to like an outpatient sleep lab? Mm. Do some of them get home sleep studies? Yeah. It's Is a, your pulmonologist reading it? Who's, how does that work? It's a good mix. We don't, as a, like an ENT office, we don't do our own sleep studies. So there is a sleep group within Christ that we'll kind of team up with. And there are a couple other community sleep centers that we're also um, not partnered with, but we just commonly are, you know, we whether it's referring patients back and forth, um, but we'll get patients that way. And then sometimes you get patients who had a sleep study at a, a random sleep center. And whether it was home or a facility, depending on the amount of data from the study, you know, you're able to use that. Dentists, too, yeah. actually, we've seen a lot of overlap with um, dentistry and sleep apnea. And so that's been another, another source. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. In term two, one with the sleep lab. So in kids, we don't usually do home sleep studies mm-hmm. in, in children. Um, and most of our kids end up, we'll get them within like children's. However, we will have kids that come with outside sleep studies. And every once in a while, I just always ask the families, do we feel like, it, and you know, some families can't travel. Mm-hmm. Like it's asking for a yeah. lot because you need the parent, the kid to come stay overnight. If they have other children at home, child oh, care, I mean, gosh, it's a big, yeah. uh, it's a big to do. But um, I always ask if they're going to do something locally, just make sure it's at a place where they're used to doing sleep studies in kids, oh, yeah. the hookup process, all that, as well as um, I would assume that whoever's reading it, they're also reading pediatric mm-hmm. sleep studies as well. And so that at least in the pediatric, that can kind of be a little tricky because every once in a while, it's hard to know how to put that into context, I guess. For sure. Yeah. And then the dental point is very interesting, too, because we are seeing a lot more, um, I think that our pediatric dentists screen a lot more for pediatric OSA mm-hmm. um, because of, you know, the use sedation in their clinics. Oh, um, yeah. And I'm I'm thankful that they're, you know, because, you know, a child with severe OSA with some, you know, in an outpatient dental setting potentially could have a complication right. from sedation and things like that. So they're very vigilant about that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And so I think they do play a role um, in terms of screening as well as um, other potential treatment options. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to also include them at the table so we can figure out how to continue to have evidence-based and where different things play into the sleep algorithm, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And and to that point, like figuring out, you know, there's plenty of people that come in to see me with this. And I feel like I talk more people out of surgery than I do into surgery, right? I mean, that's... Yeah. And dentistry is a big component to that. Dental appliances, and it's not like it works for everybody, but I do think that's become a more important piece to just consider in the big picture of sleep apnea. So finding somebody 
within your community or finding other people who perhaps do a good job of making appliances has been a useful thing. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that in the last probably three to four years, even in the pediatric population, the role of dental appliances, A, it's not well defined, yeah. but that option is becoming there. Yeah. And I think that patients, you're not going to, it's not like a ton of patients because one, insurance doesn't cover it, so it's cash. Yeah. And two, these are kids that they have to wear something every <laughs> night, right? right? But you're going to have a handful, and I literally say a handful per year, maybe one or two per year. So it's not a ton in my practice that might come and ask me what my thoughts are on an oral appliance in like a seven-year-old mm -hmm. with OSA. Right. And the question is, you know, A, I don't really know because we, it's not like we know, do you do it after a TNA? Do you do it as an option, alternative TNA? Yeah. If you do it, like who? Is it moderate to severe OSA, mild OSA? Mm -hmm. Do you get a sleep study at some point? Like how long do you do it for? And so there's so many different questions, I feel, with that piece. Mm. And so I think opportunities at some point to kind of figure out because I think that is something that's there and we just have to figure out how it fits in. Right. Well, and then also, you know, with like mandibular development and dentition and occlusion and all of that and a kid who's still continuing to grow, that's a whole nother yeah. factor to it. Yeah. I can imagine there's a lot. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems more, it seems better established, I think, in the adults yeah, though, yeah, in yeah. terms of the dental option. Yeah. Do you perform dice then? So let's say you get a patient, yeah. they have OSA, um, let's say it's moderate sure. or like, you know, H, so H I've like, maybe let's say not even moderate, let's say like, you know, 10 mild, right? Like, but still enough to where there's something, right? Do you think about dice? Do you dice everybody? Do you get CINE MRIs? Right. Do you sort of then how do you kind of work them up? Yeah, I think for people who, so for the nerve stimulator, the criteria is to have an AHI of like, 15 to 65 was the original criteria. And there are people that do fall outside of those parameters on a pretty rare basis, but um, that's at least where we kind of start with it. So if they're less than 15, I don't really do dice procedures unless you've said, okay, we've tried an oral appliance, or we've tried sleep apnea. If you're really getting into the deeper workup for those patients, but more often the dice is reserved for uh, when we're kind of going down the pathway of we're going to do surgery, what's that going to look like? Whether it's for the nerve stimulator or if you're going to consider something else like tonsillectomy or UPPP. And then is that something you do as a separate or you dice? You think you're going to do a TNA or you think you're going to do a UPPP? Mm. You do the dice and then you go ahead and proceed with surgery at the same time? Or is it always a separate procedure? Typically a separate, okay. just so that you can... To get all the information. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Just to make sure that particularly for the nerve stimulator, it comes down to approval with insurance and making sure that patients are meeting criteria. And sometimes if you have questions about their candidacy based on the scope, you can have, you can get, you know, you can upload them to the cloud and get second opinions on where their collapse is happening and if they're a good candidate for the nerve stimulator or not. So we typically make that its own procedure. And that way patients know it's a pretty simple in and out. You go to sleep, you're awake pretty quickly and you get yeah. your answers. Okay. Yeah. And do y'all do CINE MRIs in adults? Not generally. No, it hasn't. Okay. Um, at least not with the nerve stimulator that it hasn't been a main um, piece to the workup. It's really just been based more off the dice. All right. That makes sense. So I guess before we get into like criteria and who's a good candidate, um, how, how does the nerve stimulator work? What's the goal of it? Sure. That's a great question because I think a lot of people hear what it is and, and then when they hear actually how it works, it's a, it's a little different. So it's two incisions and you implant typically on the right because we reserve the left if somebody would need like a pacemaker. We stay away from the heart. So you go on the right and you put a processor in the chest that has a battery and there's a sensor lead that feeds off of it down into the rib cage so that it can sense um, when they're breathing. And then there's a stimulator that runs. It's a little wire that kind of comes up the neck. And there is a second incision kind of under the jawline. And that's how you place the stimulator lead on the hypoglossal nerve. So once you're done with that at night, when they go to sleep, they take a device that kind of looks like a mouse for a computer. And you turn the device on and you can change this. But after a certain period of time, it will begin working. So that every time the patient breathes, so whenever it senses that there's chest wall expansion or movement, that will gently stimulate the base of tongue to push forward and tighten up. 
So it's not okay. just working when you snore. It's not just working when you have apneas. It's doing it with every single breath that it's pushing the tongue forward. And you can turn it on and off at night if you, you know, if you wake up and you need to use the restroom or something, you can turn it off and turn it back on. But that's generally, generally how it works. Okay. And so it, it's pulling the tongue forward. So who, what are the criteria now? Like who's a good candidate? Um, do they have had, already had to try CPAP for a certain number of times? Or I think you'd mentioned a range of HI mm -hmm. weight. What makes, who, who are the people that kind of fit? Uh, potential at the mold for it yeah um yeah so so again you want to at least see moderate sleep apnea so hi over 15 um we have implanted people over 65 and i think that's an important thing as we get into outcomes that you have to consider of like what were the initial parameters and how did you get the outcomes for that and then if you start implanting people with a super high hi you can't really have the same expectation that they're going to get as low afterwards right. but um so generally it's been 15 to 65 was the ahi and bmi we like to see that less than 35 and that's variable too because it depends on their insurance some insurances require lower some really don't have any guidelines for that but generally we want to see that um they're not too overweight uh, when you're considering yeah. it and Another really important piece to it is to make sure on their sleep study that they're not having a lot of central apneas or mixed apneas. And so the difference okay. there, you know, obstructive is that you're, something's blocking off your airway, whereas central, you're not trying to breathe. And so if you're not trying to breathe, it's not going to matter if you stimulate the base of tongue, it's, you're not going to breathe. So um, you really don't want to implant anybody that's got central or mixed apneas greater than 25% of their sleep study. and the last thing is, as you mentioned, CPAP. So we really want to see that they've failed CPAP because it is still the gold standard of managing sleep apnea, and it has great results if people use it regularly. But there are plenty of people who just don't tolerate use. They, whether it's claustrophobia or they're swallowing air or you could go on and on, or they're caught up in the inconvenience of using CPAP. Um, that's part of it. It's pretty rare that we'll implant somebody that hasn't tried CPAP. Um, I mean, I think there's a few situations where you could consider it, but it gets me back to that point where I say, I really try to talk people <laughs> out of surgery sometimes because if CPAP's working, that's great, you know? And I get it can be inconvenient, but it's still a device that's implanted in you. It's a, it's a battery. There's limitations afterwards in terms of, you know, MRIs or whatnot. So, just a lot of things to consider rather than just, I've got sleep apnea, CPAP annoys me, and I want to put this device in. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the main criteria. So in your practice, do you have them try CPAP for like six months, three months? Do you feel like you kind of have like a time frame that you want them to at least keep trying? And do you work with the sleep, like your pulmonologist with that? Or how do you help that part of it? Yeah, we work pretty well with pulmonology. So often we'll at least try a month. And they're able to, you know, look at the device and see how much they're using it, how long at night they're, how much adherence they're having to using the device. And you kind of take that all in perspective. And really it just boils down to if they've tried the CPAP and they're just not doing well with it. If we get to that point of yeah. the discussion, that's when we just say, okay, you could consider the, uh, the implant. So you described um, two incisions, mm -hmm. one in the chest and one kind of right, maybe submandibular area. Mm -hmm. Do you monitor uh, the marge for that or do you just go below the gland or um, is that a concern? Like, how do you monitor? Yeah, for sure. So it's really interesting you bring that up. You know, I feel like in training, we're always taught like two finger breaths below the mandible to avoid yeah. the marge, right? Like we, we avoid yes. that nerve at all costs. And right. the way that this was taught to implant, you, you end up making an incision a lot closer to the uh, mandible. It's more like a finger breath because you kind of, you're trying to find the hyoid and you find the midline and you try to split the difference and kind of extend it back from there. So you end up being, I think, a little bit closer anatomically to the marge. I don't specifically monitor it during surgery, but it is like, you know, you can see their mouth in view when you have them prepped out. So you're able to tell if you're getting stimulation or if you're getting close. I've never had anybody that's had marge weakness afterwards because I still, even though the incision is high, I still aim really low to get down on the bottom part of the submandibular gland just so you're not close to it and then um, you work your way up. 
And then for the chest incision, are you like uh, below the pec and the nipple? Like where exactly are, where is that? Yeah. And are you going down to rib? Like, do you have to worry about pneumothorax? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? So when I first started doing the procedure, it was three incisions and the, you know, the one incision was a couple finger breaths below the collarbone. So that was for the device. And then the sense lead was down kind of, you know, along like if you come down under their armpit and you come across from the just kind of like in a, like a bra line, it would sit down along the, the ribs there. So that was the third incision. But we really don't do that anymore because now you're placing the sense lead within that uh, higher incision. So it's two finger okay. breaths below the collarbone. And you once you've made a pocket for where the implanter is going to sit, you just kind of go through pec major and you'd bluntly divide okay. it until you're getting down to the intercostals. And you try to find the nice plane between the internal and external intercostals, which it's not something that, again, in training, look, I never <laughs> was dissecting down onto the ribs. So initially yeah. it was always a very like, oh my gosh, we're, we're near the lung. You know, it's right through there. And, yeah. and uh, you're definitely cognizant of it, but it's got some really, really good safe anatomy to get to that level. And you develop the pocket between the two muscles, between the intercostals, and you feed the sense lead there. So as you said, um, pneumothorax is one of the reported risks of the procedure. I personally, knock on wood, haven't been affected by it. And again, I think it's, you just, you're smart when you get down to that point and you're delicate as you work between the muscles to avoid that complication. And we also check for a, we do a chest x-ray afterwards to make sure there's no issue okay. with pneumothorax, especially. Yeah. Do these patients then um, stay overnight? Do you have some that just go home the same day? Is this outpatient? It's it's outpatient. Um, generally, the surgery, we schedule it for about maybe two hours or a little bit under that. And they go home afterwards. So we do the chest x-ray and recovery to make sure that the implant's sitting in a good spot and that they don't have an pneumothorax and just really to document its location. And we'll, we'll just see how they're doing. But it's it's an outpatient surgery. We don't plan for anybody to stay. And it's pretty well tolerated, particularly with a pain perspective. Um, you know, you get some tightness that happens up under the digastric. So they'll have some, maybe some jaw and ear and, you know, tongue pain, but nothing that's not controlled by oral pain medication at home. So like Tylenol Motrin or do you ever have to do narcotics? We'll use narcotics. Yeah. We'll give them a short, uh, a couple of days worth of that to help, but that's all it typically requires. Do you ever do steroids or anything like that post-op? Does that help for inflammation or pain or? Yeah, we do the intraoperative dosing, but we don't typically send them home on any, you know, medrol packs or, or any decadron. We just give them the intraop dose. Do you have to do antibiotics um, since it's an implant? Yeah, I normally do. <laughs> just and it's just because you just kind of feel like okay we're putting in a device in uh, you're in the mouth it's some component of this so i typically put them on a seven-day course of antibiotics just to to have that and do you just do like augmentin or what's your go-to for this um typically keflex i just put them keflex. on keflex okay. and you know again knock on wood <laughs> and, yeah. just, and, and we'll often <laughs> use um we we'll use antibiotic irrigations like when okay. we've placed some of the, um, when you place the stimulator cuff, you'll kind of flush it with some antibiotic irrigation too. And again, ultimately we haven't had any major, we haven't had any uh, infections of the device yeah. and we keep it pretty sterile. I shouldn't say pretty sterile. We keep it strictly sterile. We haven't had yeah. any issues with it, but putting them on antibiotics is really just to make it seem a little cleaner. Okay. I, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> And then how long do you have to wait before they can start using it or turning it on? Yeah. So is there like a healing time? Yeah, we'll have them. It's about four to five weeks after it's implanted. So they'll come in for a first post-op just to make sure the neck's healing well and they're not having any complaints or issues and that it's sitting in a good spot. And then generally it's a waiting game. Um, I, I will say it's important to note, we do check the device once it's implanted. So we'll make okay. sure that it's working, that you're getting good tongue protrusion and that the tongue is not pulling back at all because it's okay. really important when you place the device that you only include the branches of the hypoglossal nerve that pull the tongue forward because you don't want to stimulate wow, any okay. of the retrusor branches that's one of the you know potential down not downfalls of the surgery but it would be a limitation of it if you start pulling the tongue back with stimulation so we right. make sure of that but then we turn it off 
and they'll get it activated with sleep about four to five weeks afterwards. Okay. So in the OR, before you close up, you activate and then make sure that when it's turned on, the tongue is getting pulled forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we make sure that we get good sensing of respirations and that you don't have too much cardiac, you know, interference with that sensation, with the sense lead. And we also make sure that the tongue is in a good spot and stimulates nice and that you can go to a very low level of stimulation and not see any retrusion of the tongue. Do you have um, any special landmarks or techniques to help you feel like your sensors where it should oh, be? Oh, yeah. Um, for the, how do you know? Well, when you're dissecting on the hypoglossal nerve, there are a couple little landmarks. Um, really, the main one is you're just looking for what we call the break point where you can see these retrusor branches kind of extending up. And so we have, we will use a nerve stimulator for that and kind of okay. stimulate the inclusion branches and your exclusion branches. And you'll kind of tell when you've, you know, you'll isolate the nerve, maybe put a vessel loop around it to say, here's the branches we want to include. And then you use a little probe to stimulate them and make sure that your inclusion branches are stimulating well and that you're not including any of the retrusor branches. Ah, I see. That's pretty neat. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize. And is that, um, this might be a dumb question. Is that just like a NIMS monitor mm -hmm. then when you're doing yeah. that? It's just like the straight up NIMS that we use for like a parotid exactly. or a thyroid or whatever. It's just that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And then, okay. So you see them post-op. How is it common to have like a device infection or anything? What if you see like, you know, redness or drainage at the chest mm. or under the mandible? Do you, um, how do you treat that usually? Um, it's a good question. I will say I haven't personally, I am just jinxing myself to death. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm like you're going to kill me after this podcast. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. But really, um, I, we haven't had any device infections, pneumothoraces. Really the main complaint afterwards is, is, is pain or that people will say, wow, it's kind okay. of tight up under here. I didn't think it would be that, that tight. And you'll see this mild kind of um, just thickening to the skin. And I think it's because you're doing a lot of muscle retraction when you're pulling on the digastric and the mylohyoid to get up yeah. along. You really have to go pretty distal on the hypoglossal nerve. So I think some of the retraction and then you you also attach the stimulator or at least part of it, you anchor it on the digastric. And I think there's some discomfort with that that I really try to make sure I tell people of beforehand and and maybe they they're like, okay, yeah, it's tight when I swallow. But you often give them reassurance and ultimately it, it goes away pretty quickly. And this might be a, a silly question, but um, no uh, concerns about like oral dysphagia swallowing immediately post-op or right. weird art sounds with articulation or anything, yeah, no, anything like that from swelling or you'd anything? You'd be surprised. The nerve is very robust, you know, so you don't get the, the seeing any um, weakness of the hypoglossal nerves really rare. Um, I always tell people it's a risk, but it, it's a rare thing to see. So most swallowing, I tell people to start maybe with a soft diet at first. And once you see that that goes well, you can go to a regular diet, whether that's post-op day zero or whenever. Um, I, you don't really hear of any issues with swallowing. You got to love a robust nerve. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can be, um, it is a very good nerve to, to work on for sure for that reason. That's <laughs> All right. So you've seen them. They look like they're healing. Now we're like post-op week four to six. Um, they go back to Palm. And at that point, they can then uh, help guide them of starting to turn it on using the mouse, putting it on the sensor portion or the lead, I mm -hmm. guess, in the chest. And they can start and they just put that on before they go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just kind of hold it over it, right? Like you just Oh. You hold the device kind of on top of your chest where your processor is, uh -huh. and then and then you take it away. So it doesn't have to stay there all oh, night. Okay. It just is there to, okay. to turn it on, to activate it. And does the uh, sleep pulmonologist then kind of adjust the settings? Like, how do you know, like, are there certain settings, or it just automatically kind of goes with your, your breathing? Right. There, and then that gets a little bit out of our wheelhouse a little bit because sleep will manage a lot of those settings but ultimately there are different configurations on the stimulator that they can adjust so if okay. you're not doing well with a particular pattern they can they can change that and in terms of the intensity or the duration a lot of that is all modifiable and it's not um i think an important People often say, like, am I getting shocked in my base of tongue? It's not like a, it's not a shocking <laughs> thing. It's more of just like a, you know, 
tense kind of tightening sensation that you would that they would feel. So they're able to make those adjustments. And the device, about 70% of people, when they go for that initial activation, they're yeah. good to go. You know, it, it works. They're getting a good level of stimulation. It's comfortable and they're sleeping and they're happy. But you do have an important percentage of people who, and that's another thing I try to stress preoperatively, is don't think that we just put this in and you turn it on and sleep apnea is gone. You know, you have to maybe work with it and calibrate it. Kind of like, you know, when you get glasses for the first time, it's not like it's just easy for yeah. everybody. It takes some getting used to. Even CPAP for some people it takes getting used to. So they'll work with sleep over time to maybe make modifications. And rare, rarely would we then see somebody back in the office who, hey, we've tried these different configurations. Maybe the sleep study, we're not getting them exactly where we want with AHI. So let's let's do a scope while they're out, turn on the device and see where our different stimulations are happening of the base of tongue. And you can kind of modify it that way too. I see. Okay. And so is there like, okay, so you put the implant in, then you've turned it on about a month later. When do they get a sleep study again with a device on? Is that at that initial turn on or is it a couple months later? They'll do about three months generally just to make sure that the device is in. Um, they're at a comfortable kind of, you know, subjectively we're getting good improvement. And then you, you let them use that for a bit before you check the formal sleep study. So let's say you have the repeat sleep study at three months. What's a what's a good outcome? I mean, you kind of mentioned, you know, the HI range is between the indication is 15 to 65. Mm -hmm. And the higher, I would imagine, you start with in terms of resolution, right, the less that's going to be. I mean, it's the same way with H OSA in kids. The more severe you start, the harder it is to uh, resolve it or completely, quote, cure it uh, to an HI of less than whatever the min is, uh, minimum mm -hmm. is. Um, so what, how do you, how do you, what's a good outcome or how do you talk to patients about that? Yeah. Um, great question. So there were a lot of studies that have looked at you know, these different registries where they've followed a lot of patients to see generally where, where are we starting with an AHI? Generally they'll, they'll report median AHIs and then you see where they wind up afterwards. And so they're still developing a lot of that longer term follow-up, but generally they've brought people from let's go with the low mid 30s of an AHI, median AHI, and it brings them down to about six to nine. So yeah. you're about 90, but it's like just over 90% of people are brought down to no sleep apnea or mild sleep apnea, right? Wow. So that's really good. And, and again, it's still to tell people, don't think that we're going to put this in and that all snoring is gone and you don't have sleep apnea. It's more this is your further down the road or further down the line procedure to consider. So if somebody's not tolerating CPAP and they're just sitting at home with an AHI of 65 and not doing anything, yeah, if you can bring them down to mild sleep apnea, that would be awesome. It's really going to improve their long-term health. So I think the education up front is important with regards to that. Um, but another parameter they follow is the Epworth sleepiness scale. So the perception yeah. by patients um, is really good. I think it it brings them from perceiving daytime sleepiness to a lower number. So you're getting yeah. good outcomes with regards to that. And a lot of these devices have a really good patient network that if you have a patient interested in the device, you can set them up with somebody who's already been implanted and they can talk to them oh, and see what it's like. That's awesome. You know, it's kind of like cochlear implants, I feel like, that yeah. or a lot of the other um, implantable devices. It's important to talk to others who've had it and hear yeah. it firsthand from them. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think that's pretty cool that that network and communities or support is there for patients oh, yeah. and families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to see your long-term results. And that's what's been cool to work with sleep medicine and have now a coordinator that's kind of we're following our own patients long term and seeing our outcomes, which are the same as what you're getting on a national level. And it's pretty cool to, because, you know, when you operate on somebody and you don't see them back, <laughs> it's generally because yeah. they're better, but you always, you never, you never get to see your yeah. patients that are doing better back. It's right. If you have issues. So it is nice to get some of that uh, feedback and follow up. Um, one other question, or actually in terms of uh, candidacy, um, do you feel that uh, the patients that do have a, uh, lingual tonsils, for mm. example, or, you know, maybe have a slightly, I don't know, maybe some sort of elongation of the soft palate, mm -hmm. or do you ever 
do those surgeries first and then consider staging? Or at that point, if you're thinking about putting a stimulator in, you've already bypassed all that. Like, are, are there certain patients you're like, you know, your lingual tonsils are huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually we, just, we just need to get those out yeah, first. Yeah, this happened pretty recently. I had a patient who, you know, they're on kind of this track to consider the implant and you do your dice. And truly during this dice, the tonsils, the amount of collapse that was just lateral wall collapse and purely tonsil and everywhere else looks fine. You're kind of like, look, you don't fit the mold for needing a tonsillectomy. I totally get it. Yeah. But you're if you're younger or if maybe they don't have, maybe their HI is 16 and you're just creeping into candidacy. If I was young and that was me, I would say, okay, well then let's try the tonsillectomy yeah. or the lingual tonsillectomy. So I think you'll you'll pick up on that with the dice to make sure that that there isn't a very exaggerated contribution to their sleep apnea, or if it's just the normal multi level collapse and and, and you yeah. get about it that way. So I think that's a great point because you know in kids tonsil size always isn't a predictor. Mm -hmm. You'll see kids in clinic with two four plus kissing tonsils have normal sleep studies. Or kids with one plus, <laughs> two plus that you don't think much is there. And you might get a sleep study and be like, oh, okay. And then you take the tonsils out and they actually get a little bit better. And I always tell families are kind of like belly buttons, you know, <laughs> like they're, you oh, know, yeah. I think when yeah. they sleep, they're kind of, they'll fall yeah. out, like fall into the pharynx when, when sometimes they're asleep <laughs> and maybe we just don't always appreciate right. it. One other question for you is um, right now in kids, we, I think, uh, you know, we do the TNA, they might sell residual moderate to severe OSA, they might need CPAP, uh, maybe they can't tolerate it for like six months, maybe you do a DICE or a city MRI, uh, depending on where you practice and what you your, uh, what you prefer. We will do, I feel like, because it's not approved, obviously, in under 18 yet, you know, tongue-based surgery or lingual tonsillectomy, if that tissue is there. Um, in terms of adult, like, base of tongue surgery, is the stimulator replacing that then, like a posterior midline glossectomy mm. or tongue-based re reduction, is this in lieu of that? I would say, you know, I don't do a lot of lingual tonsillectomies, right? I mean, just, and yeah. it's not because I'm biased towards doing the implant. I think there, there are patients where I'll say, look, you know, there's hyoid suspension. You can do these other procedures to tighten up yeah. the pharynx in various ways or reduce the base of tongue. And I think they're all things to consider doing. And you kind of walk them through. And I've even referred people to other physicians that do those procedures to say, why don't you talk to them about yeah. it, you know, before you get this implant? Because I still put the implant as being far enough down the line right now that we want to make sure that it's either a specific area that you can't control like tonsils or their palate or the base of tongue, or make sure you know of all of the other non-implantable procedures you could do, look at their outcomes and and make that decision, you know, sometimes for yourself. But yeah, I think if, if again, if, if somebody's got exaggerated lingual tonsils and that's what's collapsing on their dice, it's totally yeah. worth trying to do that rather than okay. if there's somebody that can go through it medically based on their medical history or their age. Yeah, I think that's still something important to remember that this hasn't just gone from CPAP to nerve stimulator, you know? Yeah. 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 And I, I think my, the questions I keep asking is because I still find it so hard to identify the level of obstruction, mm -hmm. right? It's multi-level and it's hard to know exactly where and then what's, what procedure is going to help. Well, yeah. And that's, and it's an important point that you bring up because on the dice, really the main thing we're looking for, for the nerve stimulator is that they don't have lateral wall collapse. Because if you yeah. think if you're going to stimulate your base of tongue to go forward and they're primarily yeah. getting a, a concentric or lateral collapse, you're not helping that with the device. Yeah. So the dice is sometimes more important from an exclusion perspective, as opposed to, oh, this is your level, so we should do this procedure, right? right. So that's an important point. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Uh, in terms of, you had mentioned battery and MRI. Oh, um, yeah. How do you talk to patients about the battery and potential needs of MRI? What are the limitations? So that's kind of a moving target, I would say, the MRI indications. Generally, I tell people, expect that you're not going to be able to get an MRI of the right chest or kind of right upper extremity, kind of this area, because that's where the battery is going to be. Now, there are, as the device continues to change, the company um, or the companies continue to send out, here are the MRIs that are allowed or the regions that are allowed. But ultimately, it's good to just make sure that people understand up front, there may be limitations. We haven't done any like removals of a device so that somebody could get an MRI. We haven't ever run into that. 
Um, the battery itself lasts currently about 11 years. So we tell people expect that in 11 years, if and when the battery is not working, you can do an outpatient surgery just to replace the processor with the battery. And that's just your chest incision? Yeah, the high okay. chest incision. Yep. Yep. So you just uh -huh. go through that. And so we'll get to that point someday once, once you get there. But the device also continues to, like I said, it evolves a lot in terms of what's, what battery it is, what the MRI compatibility is. So it's just good to make sure that patients, you know, ask about that and see what the most recent guidelines are and limitations. Yeah. As we uh, are slowly wrapping up, are there any other final pearls or things that you found in your experience, whether it's surgical or just managing these patients that you could, that you have for our listeners? You know, okay, this is, a, this is I think, a really good point. So I, I'm, I look pretty young, but I'm also still pretty early in practice, right? So, and I'm sure you get this too, that when people come in, a very common question is how many of these have you done? Yeah. Or are you comfortable doing this? And um, I now enjoy the question because I used to always be like, oh gosh, they're asking again how, yes, I know I'm young. But I, I remember when I first started doing this, <laughs> you know, initially people would come in, they're like, how many have you done? And I said, you're going to be my first patient. And I wouldn't hold back. <laughs> and I wasn't like trying to like freak them out. Yeah. But I'm like, well, you know, ultimately, yeah. you know, Dr. Hellman, um, my partner that does these, he was really, it was great to work with him initially because I was able to do several cases with him, see how he does it and learn from his, any mistakes that he's had, or if he's, if he's found certain pearls that work really well for it. I, it was really, really important. And this goes not just obviously for the surgery, but anybody that's wanting to start a new procedure, trying to find somebody else that does it, that you trust, that you can work with is really, really important because you see like, oh, I don't know anything about this. It is okay. I can do this. This is a straightforward thing. So getting those discussions with patients initially was really tough because there were plenty of people that go, thanks, I'm going to go talk to somebody else. I'm yeah. like, okay, I get it. You know, they're, <laughs> and fighting through the frustrations initially of, oh my gosh. People come to me and I, I can't do the surgery because I haven't done it. How am I going to even get experience? Yeah. And eventually, you know, everybody's had good outcomes. And so even that first, the first lady that I implanted, I remember I told her, I was like, well, you'll be the first. And she said, great, let's go. You're not going to mess it up. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. And, and yeah. from there, it's been, um, it's been fine. You know, you get to a point where you can comfortably say you've done, I think I've done uh, upwards of 30 of them now, which factoring in COVID where we weren't even operating yeah. for a period of time, that's been a good number to do over a year and a half or two years or so. So yeah, I think the pearl from that is for anybody that I didn't do it in training, you hear about it, you, it's interesting, but you, you, you can't figure out a way to see the outcomes of patients. So talk to other people who are experts in the field and get the encouragement from them. And then when you have the encouragement, try to find somebody that does it. And and just kind of take it one step at a time. Uh, and eventually, you know, the practice builds from there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Matt, yeah. and sharing your experience. Congratulations Thanks. on just building your practice and, you know, just being a pioneer. Thank you for just being open with us. Um, no you can find Matt at the Christ Hospital Physicians ENT in Cincinnati. Matt, are you on any social media where if our listeners wanted to uh, find out more about you, they can get in touch with you or? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. That is okay. They can yeah. listen to this podcast right. and find out That's about you. That's how they're going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have any other platforms that I'm, that I utilize for that. And now mm -mm. <laughs> I lay low. I lay low. I, I hear you. All right. Well, uh, thank you for our listeners for tuning in. Uh, for our new listeners, thank you for joining us. And of course, any of our returning listeners, thank you for stopping by again. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, and Ghana. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Backtable ENT. We love feedback. Reach out to us for topics, ideas, uh, speakers, or if you ever want to come on the show. And I think that's a wrap. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team lead is Karen Yen with support from Caleb Hodson. 
and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.